Hopefully you guys will be able to understand me okay. Everyone doing all right so far? Now obviously you can tell I don't have an Everett accent. It's, uh, I'm from Marysville, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> so I'm not from obviously this area, I'm from uh, Ireland, for those who have ever been. Has anyone ever been to Ireland? Yeah, we have one or two, okay. So yeah, come on, grab a seat, feel part of the gang and then I'm going to dive in. Okay, let me pray quickly. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence. Thank you for this time that we have, Lord, this time we have to learn about the power of the gospel. I ask you, Holy Spirit, anoint my lips, Lord. I pray that you'd open every heart to receive what you have uh, given me, that I can give it away. We love you. We love the gospel, and we, uh, we desire, Jesus, to see you lifted high in this community again and again. In Jesus' name, <clears throat> amen. Amen. Okay, quick overview just to, before I dive in. So for those who are not aware of, of who I am or what I do, in 2014, I, I was employed to be a full-time evangelist. Now, I've traveled a little and my kind of, or our concept of an evangelist seems to be different than some other people's. So all we knew in my community, an evangelist is somebody that stands on the street all day, every day, and talks about Jesus. No fancy office, no PA, no nice reclining chair, just standing all day, every day on the street. Now, I've been to a few of the churches and they're like, really? We don't do that. We have, you know, we just speak at different events and things like this. So it's a different kind of setup. But for us in our culture, evangelists, evangelists on staff were just guys who just, you go there, spend the whole day talking about Jesus. That's kind of the way we did it. So I was birthed in this baptism of fire. I was placed on a street and asked to, uh, to lead people to the Lord. And it was a huge jump for me. At the time uh, I was employed, I was what I call a sowing evangelist. So what that meant is that up until uh, I was leading someone to the Lord into a relationship with Jesus, maybe once every four weeks. Now that didn't seem, you know, for us at that time, that seemed like, you know, quite a, a feat. It was something that was, uh, you know, uh, it was quite impressive in our community because we just weren't seeing things like that. I'm talking about strangers and, and, and things like that. So for, to go from one every four weeks to one every day, which is what my pastor had asked me to do, was a huge step of faith, as you can imagine, you know. So I'm just trying to get you to see where I was at. So how did I go from a sowing evangelist into a reaping evangelist? Because that's what happened. There was a, a transition that was a, a very a clear distinction. So I'm going to tell you how. This is how. I step onto the streets and the whole, uh, right at the beginning. I step onto the streets and I'm feeling nervous. I'm feeling out of my depth. Has anyone ever felt out of their depth when it comes to, to doing the work of an evangelist? That's good. You're in good company. So I felt all these emotions. I'm thinking, man, this is too, too big a deal for me. It's too big a challenge. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And when the Holy Spirit speaks, things change. Like, he shifts everything, yeah? Jesus, when Jesus spoke, he could say the, like, most simplest phrase, but it was so profound, it could change, it would change people's lives. And he still does the same today. <clears throat> this is what the Lord said. The Holy Spirit said, Scott, I want you to look around this community, around this town. I want you to look at all the people, and I want you to imagine them like they are apples on a tree. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm getting there in my, in my head. So I want you guys to do the same, yeah? Put yourself in a busy place in your community and imagine people are like apples on a tree. And then the Lord said this, when you share, I'll shake. You share and I'll shake. And for the first time in my life, I realized that evangelism wasn't on me. You see, I, up until that point, I thought it was how, about how good I was or what I could deliver or what I could do or what I couldn't do. It was this pressure about feeling that I had to, in some way, deliver. And in this moment, I realized that it wasn't about me, that all I had to do was to, to play my part, which is to share. And the Holy Spirit would do the rest. He would shake the tree. Now, some apples will fall. This is what the Lord began to show me. Some apples will fall, some will move a little, and some won't move at all. But what I've been called to do is to catch the apples that fall. You see, in John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus said, nobody can come to me unless the Father draws them. So what that means is you could have the slickest evangelism presentation. You could uh, you just stepped out of the salon. Your hair's looking beautiful. Uh, you've just been on the sunbeds. You know, you've been on holiday. You're looking amazing. You could have the best level of rhetoric. You could have re read all the books. But unless they're being drawn, it means nothing. And what that is, is partnership. Because I go where he's already gone. It's called partnership. 
You know, Bono from U2. You guys heard of U2, the, the, the rock band from Ireland? Uh, they're from Ireland, but they're uh, well, well known. They're quite well known. So the lead singer, he says this, Bono, he said this. He said, as Christians, we're always asking God to bless what we're doing. Find out what he's doing because it's already blessed. Now, what we do as evangelists is we partner with the Holy Spirit. If you want to be fruitful, find out what he's doing because it's already blessed. For many evangelists, they spend a lot of time banging their head against a brick wall, trying to catch apples that simply are not ready to fall. So what they do is they stand there debating an apple that's not ready to fall. Okay, That's not what we're doing. I've got good news for you today. You don't need any answers to any questions. You don't need to have, uh, have read uh, many apologetic books. This Jesus at the door is a reaping tool which I'm going to explain a little bit more about later. But let me, just touch, let me just expound this a bit. Okay, so the Holy Spirit shows me, you share, I'll shake. And I began to understand it for the first time in my life that it was partnership. Now, I knew in my head, but I didn't really feel it. When I stepped out to share the gospel all my whole life, whenever I did, I always felt like, man, I, I'm in this. I've got to do something good for God. I'm in this alone. It was like dig my heels in, uh, regurgitate all the books and documentaries I'd, I'd ever read, try and verbally wrestle these people to the ground. Defending God's honor all the way. I'm, I'm defending his honor. Somebody says, oh, I don't really believe that. And then I've got to defend God's honor. You know, how, how, how I answer myself is defending him. That's not what we're talking about. It changed the way I thought about it. This is why. The Great Commission wasn't called the Great Mission. It was called the Great Commission because it takes two years. The Holy Spirit extends an invitation to every single blood-bought believer that bears his name. And he says this, will you partner with me? And together we're going to change the world. Everybody. So you say, Scott, I'm not very good with people. I'm, I'm introverted. You know, I, I was bullied at school. I don't get on with people too good. I'm just too shy. Uh, or, you know, I don't really hit it off with people. Or whatever many reasons you may have. Nothing anymore is a hindrance to you. God would not call you to a task without equipping you with the skills to get it done. So he's equipped you because the Great Commission, it wasn't given to evangelists per se. It was given to disciples. So if you're a disciple in this room right now, you're called as much as me to go and make disciples. But what we've got to do is we've got to realize that we have been called. And not only have we been called, but we've been equipped. And when you go, he goes with you. And let me tell you this, the best part of this whole thing is that he shakes the tree. You don't have to do the shaking. I meet many believers, you know, and they go into the streets and the people, they stop do the sharing and they do the shaking. <laughs> Good news is it's the other way around. We share, he shakes. It's fluid partnership and all we've got to do is move with the spirit and I promise you it's easy. So that's the Great Commission. It was given to everybody. We can all do this, I promise you. Okay. So this is what I believe. I call it apple tree evangelism. It's like you, every day of your life, you're walking through an apple orchard. So you may work, uh, name some things you do. What do you do for a living, sir? Beer sales. Come on, like it. Keeping it real. Okay. How about you? Yeah. Okay. How about you? Good. I thought I'd seen the whole halo in your head there. Uh, how about you? Stay at home, mom. Come on. Okay, so whatever your job may be, you're, you're, every day you're surrounded by apples. Every day, no matter where you go. Even if you go to the grocery store, you go to the gym, you, you walk your dog, you pick the kids up from the school. You know, wherever you are, there's apples everywhere. Okay, how do I know everybody's an apple? Deuteronomy 32.10 Zechariah 2 verse 8, Psalm 17 verse 8, to name a few, say that we are the apple of his eye. This is what it means. Everybody's an apple. So what do we do when we do evangelism? This is what we do. We walk through the apple orchards of life every day, wherever you may be, grocery store, you know, the gym, wherever. And all you're doing is reaching out your hand, seeing if, the, if these apples are ready to fall. That's it. So Apple tree evangelism, it's like walking through the apple orchard, reaching out your hand and being willing to catch, okay? Good catch. That's all we've got to do. Now, kids can catch, old people can catch, everybody can catch because everybody is called to play. Everybody's called to be involved in this thing. It's not a certain demographic, hybrid, superstar believer that has been called to, to this task. It's every single believer on the planet.
But at the minute, we have a problem. At the moment, we have a problem. According to, according to the Barna Institute, 96% of believers are not leading anyone to the Lord. So what that means is you've got 96% of people over here who are golf clapping the professionals as the 4% are having all these stories, these wonderful stories, they're seeing these incredible things. And these guys are looking at these guys thinking, man, they're special. So we elevate them and we think they're like born cut from a different cloth. They're like, you know, they were born in these ethereal chambers and they, they arrived with the sounds of archangels. You know, we think it's a different kind of human. But what it is, is that the 4% of cotton, uh, of, we have the phrase cotton on, 4% have, uh, have understood that evangelism is partnership, that all we got to do is play our part, which is to share and let him shake and to trust the Holy Spirit's power for things to happen. But a lot of people, if they're doing anything, what they're doing is sowing. They're looking for the apple that's not ready. And then they're walking away saying, man, I'm not very good at this. I'm, just, I'm not gifted. Because if I was gifted, then, then that apple would have, would have fallen. I'm just not gifted. Or people just don't really want to know God. Not these days, maybe back in the 70s. But these days, people just, you know, kind of postmodern culture, millennialism and all this. People don't want to know God anymore. But what we're doing is we're hanging around in, the, in this field, where this sowing field, instead of vacating to the reaping fields. That's kind of where this thing is at. So Jesus at the door is a reaping tool, okay? So I'm just trying to lay the tracks for you. Now I want to tell you this, I'm going to be totally honest with you guys. I didn't sit at home in my prayer closet, and I didn't pray and fast for three weeks, saying, God, please give me an evangelistic technique that will, will win the masses. I didn't do that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing that, but personally for me, I didn't. This is what happened to me. I was on the shoreline and the Holy Spirit said, go into the deep and trust me. Now I gave up my job, I had a, a permanent job that I was working at um, as, a, as a, a worker with, I worked with uh, in a homeless shelter with addicts and different people. So I had a job that was regular pay, it meant I could put food on the table for my kids. That was a good thing, honorable thing. But the Lord's saying, here's a, here's, I want you to step into this job. The job was a six-month trial position, fruit dependent. This is what my pastor said. Six months trial, fruit dependent, one soul a day. So I'm like, do I leave my comfort to go into, this, into the unknown, the deep unknown? But I did it. And as I go into the unknown, all I had was this, the faith in, in the Lord. All I had was faith in the Spirit. That was it. I'm like, Lord, I'll do it, but I need you with me. But it wasn't. On, it wasn't on the shoreline that he gave me Jesus at the door. It was when I was in the deep. And I'm like, Lord, if, I, if you don't come through for me, I'm going to drown. It was then that the Holy Spirit said this, okay, here we go, get ready. And as I would stop somebody, this is what he did. Dropped it into my spirit. Every one of the nine points that we're going to look at was given to me by the Spirit in the harvest fields while I was talking to a man or woman not knowing what is going to come out of my mouth. That's how much faith it was born in such a culture of faith. And it was born in the harvest fields. And I believe that is why it, 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 uh, it packs such power. Because it was born in an environment with lost people. And it, it blew up like a, uh, like a bomb with lost people. And it still works with lost people because of how it was, how it was born. But that's what happened. So I would stop somebody and I like, talked to them about uh, my grandma had this image of Jesus knocking at the door, uh, the, the original one. And, you know, so I'd always had this concept in my head, and I just talked about it. Hey, you know, there's this image of Jesus knocking on the door, the concept of handles on the inside, and then I would just kind of wing it. What, what, uh, you guys don't use that phrase, no? Uh, oh, you do? Okay. Okay, so I would just wing it. i just like, hey, let me talk about this. So, no, actually, let me be honest. I, I'm, I'm not being truthful. Uh, not because I'm lying, but because I can't remember. Uh, the truth is this. What I did was pray for the sick. That's what I did. So I would talk about, I would pray for the sick, and then I would talk about the image, and then I would let the Holy Spirit do, you know, you know, give me what he gave me. So for the first three, four, five minutes, I'm praying for the sick. And then I'm waiting, uh, you know, trusting the Lord. So then the Lord would begin to give me, after I've done that, he begin to give me these points, maybe one every few weeks. And I would write it down on my phone. You know when God gives you something, you know it's from him, and you get really excited. So I, I would like be with a person, the Lord would give it to me. And all I'm thinking is, please go away, I don't want to forget this. Like, I'm just being honest. So I'm with a non-believer, and I'm thinking, man, like, yeah, he's like talking to me, and I'm thinking, remember it, remember it, because it was so good. So the, the guy goes away, I'm on my phone, and I, and I do that over a series of months. 
And that is what Jesus at the door is. It's nine, po nine points and a picture that was born in the harvest fields. But I want to say, share with you guys how the Lord um, uh, gave it to me, how he, how he changed the way I do things. So I'm, I'm doing it this way. I'm praying for the sick. And all the while, the Lord's giving me these points. So I'm praying for the sick. Then I'm sharing the gospel. Praying for the sick, sharing the gospel. And then I had it complete. And then people started, in my community, started to die. Young, young people, drug overdoses, uh, uh, suicides, just, uh, you know, violence, violent attacks, whatever it may be, people were dying. And these are people under the age of 30. And it was kind of getting crazy. And I, I knew a lot of these guys because I'd led some of them to the Lord um, and we began a new believer group and people were starting to get saved, um, you know, uh, every day as I stepped out using this, what the Lord had given me. So then I realized, man, I had this kind of crisis of faith. And uh, a friend of mine from back home, he, got, he died as well. Um, and I had this crisis of faith. I thought this, I thought, if I've got two minutes with an individual, with a stranger, and I'm using my two minutes to heal their, their broken body, which they could then be healed and die and go to hell, then I don't feel I can sleep at night if I'm not depositing the gospel, which is everlasting, and bringing them into a relationship with Jesus. I, now, everything I'd seen up until that point was that model. Going prophetic healing was this model. That's all I'd seen. But I'm like, for me, that's not good enough. That doesn't sit with me. There's something wrong in this whole deal. So I stopped it. I said, I'm not doing that anymore. And I went out and I said, if I'm going to have two minutes, I'm going to deposit the everlasting uh, lifeline. That is the gospel. I'm going to cast an everlasting lifeline. So that's what I did. And, I, and as I lent on the gospel, I'd been given it by the Holy Spirit. I didn't know the power that was in the gospel alone. And for many of us, I've got to be honest, for many of us, what's happened over time is, is that the gospel is the center, but and everything else is like um, window dressing. And I mean this in, in, with reverence. But God has given us tools and gifts and signs and wonders, but it all points towards a gospel that, that is life-changing. And what's happened along the way is we've kind of got so excited with the signs and wonders, uh, the things that, what I call sowing, that lead you to reap. We've got so enamored with these things and the wow factor when somebody gets healed that what we've done is we've kind of made that the center. So somehow along the way, that's become the center and the gospel isn't getting preached anymore. Um, you know, as long as we get, see somebody get healed, man, we go off feeling really good about ourselves. But all the while, that person can go off and they can die and go to hell. It's not really acceptable. So we need to bring it back. We need to bring things back into focus. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And I say that with totally, total reverence. I've seen many healings in my life. I've seen many people get healed. Uh, I've prayed for the sick. I still do. But the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. A prophetic word, a healing, does not change your life. The gospel changes your life. Bringing them into relationship with Jesus. I was out just last week uh, with a team, and I'm praying with some guys. We saw six people get saved in, in, about, in a matter of an hour. Like I'm talking like one lady, like weeping. Like this is door to door. You know the thing that people say you can't do? You're not allowed to do door to door. It's too reflective of Jehovah's Witnesses. Believe me, you can do anything you want. <laughs> when the Spirit's with you, you can do whatever. God, you can't box him in. You know, you do whatever you want to do and he'll bless you. So we go and we do door to door and I'm taking a team and this lady's weeping, one of them weeping in a doorway as she feels the Holy Spirit. Not one pray for the sick, nothing, not one healing, nothing, okay? So this is what happens. There's a young man who's with me. And we see about five, six people get saved at this point. And, and I'm like, hey, what do you think of this? And he's like, yeah, yeah, it's cool. Okay, that's his response. So then he comes to somebody else and he prays for somebody's leg. And somebody's leg gets healed. The guy is jumping up and down it with joy because somebody's leg got healed. Now, I'm just being honest. For me, that's not acceptable. Because if we're preaching the gospel as well as healing the sick, that's okay, okay? I'm, try, I'm just trying to say, if we're leaving it here, it's not acceptable. Because I don't want somebody, somebody's leg to be healed, and then they go off with a healed leg and walk straight through the gates of hell. That's not what I'm looking for, and what, what I believe the Lord is not looking for. So we need to make sure that we align the gospel and we hold it with the, with the reverence that it deserves. It is life-changing, okay? Right. Now, uh, so the way I describe it is that Jesus at the door is a garden where all your other gifts can grow. What it means is this, you don't need anything to begin but the gospel, which means this, 96% of people who are looking at the 4% superstars, 
they're, they're looking and they're saying, well, hang on, I can't do that. Because we've set this bar that says prophetic healing is the only way in. That's what we've done, right or wrong, that's what we've done. We've set this bar that says, this is the way you approach evangelism. You go over with a word of knowledge about a, a, a healing that needs to uh, take place, and that's your way in. Now, this is what happens. 96% are saying, I can't do that. Because if it was the way, that if it worked, then we wouldn't have so many people on the sidelines, okay? Simple fact. So we need to lower the bar. And we need to show people that you, you don't even need to pray for the sick, never hear a word of knowledge to begin, but everything else is going to grow as you move. You see, the bypro a byproduct of knowing the Holy Spirit is this, those gifts are going to flow, but you don't need them to begin. All you need is the gospel because it is, it is enough. But somewhere along the way, we've demystified. The gospel has kind of, we've lessened it and said, well, well it will work if we back it up with the, with the powerful stuff. If we back it up with the wow factor, okay, I'm going to tell you this. We're looking, for the, we're looking for them to be wowed, but God's looking for them to be wooed. That's the difference. We don't, know to, we don't need to wow them. Just let him woo them. And I found by accident that the gospel is enough to woo them into a relationship with him. I found it to be true. Okay, sorry. I'm preaching a little now. Okay, but let me get back to, the, to what I'm talking about. Okay, so this is how it works. We go out there and we begin to share and we trust the Holy Spirit. Now, evangelism, evangelism is partnership like I touched on, but I'm going to show you the depths of this partnership, okay? This is how it works. Are you guys familiar with the tandem bicycles? Yeah, you have tandem bicycles in America. Has anyone ever ridden one? You have? Come on. Anybody else? Come on. I'd say you guys are impressive. Okay, so tandem bicycle. I've never ridden one in my life. I've got to be honest, bicycle riders are not my favorite people because they, they kind of take up the whole road, and I'm like, come on, I'll move. And they're just like dominating the road, thinking, hey, I, I own this road. You know what I mean? But what happens on a tandem bike is this. It takes two people, obviously, hence the name. And on a tandem, you have this. You have the person up the front called the captain. The captain has two jobs. One, hold the bicycle upright, and two, navigate the course. Okay, why do they hold the bicycle upright? This is why. Because the person at the back has one job. The person at the back is called the stoker, and the stoker's job is to pedal. It comes from the phrase, stoking the fire. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me through a tandem bike. Now, I've never ridden one, I've been anywhere near one, but I began to research it because the Lord started speaking to me. And he showed me this. He said, Scott, I'm the captain. And every single day of your life, I'm looking and I'm saying, hey, will you start pedaling? Because I want to take you on an adventure. And the Lord showed me that every day with everyone, uh, every blood-bought believer all over the world, every day he's given you an opportunity to partner with him and to go on a, on a daily adventure. But if you don't move, if you don't pedal, you ain't going anywhere. So what's the difference between, difference between these guys, 96%, and these guys, 4%? I'm going to tell you the difference. These guys move. Simple as that. So if you move, you will see the power. Because power is in partnership. So all you've got to do is pedal. Now, how do you ride a bicycle in America? It's the same way as Ireland, yeah? You just move your left leg and your right leg, and your left leg, and your right leg. That's it. So it's kind of like walking. You just go left, right, left, right. Now, if you get on a bicycle, and it's in a high gear, it's going to be a little difficult. You're going to have to apply a lot of power. But after a little while, you're going to find that you gain momentum. And before you know it, you're riding your bicycle, and it's actually just feeling quite easy and effortless, and you're not even thinking about riding the bicycle. You're just enjoying the adventure. That's evangelism. You get on that bike, and it may be hard at the beginning, but I promise you, as you just keep moving left, right, left, right, left, right, you're going to find that, man, it's, it's, it's not that difficult. I can, I can do it. And you've got a captain leading your way the whole time. It's incredible. Every believer on the planet has been given something. It's called BO. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have BO. You guys have that phrase in America, don't you? BO. Okay. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you something straight. Every single one of you guys, you got B.O. Big time. Some have got it more than others, but you will have it. Let me tell you what it is before you start throwing apples at me. Boldness and obedience. When you got born again, you were given something. You were given a new kingdom DNA. 
And in that kingdom DNA, in that new makeup, this is what the Holy Spirit gave you. Because God said this, he said, I'm, not, I'm gonna make you a new creation and I'm not gonna call you to a task without giving you what you need to get the job done. So he's given you boldness and he's given you obedience, but you've gotta apply it. If you don't apply your B.O. and G.O., then nothing's gonna happen. Simple as that. So you've got it, but you've got, to, you've got to apply it. You've got to activate it. And this is how it works. Your left leg is boldness, and your right leg is obedience. And when you see somebody who's, who's not a believer or another human being, and you're like, I would like to talk to them, what do you do? You move boldness, obedience, even through gritted teeth. Even if you're nervous, that's okay, because this is your cost. This is your sacrifice of praise to the Lord. Boldness, whew, obedience. Boldness, obedience, and you're face to face with another human being. Then what do you do? You just share and let him shake. That's it. That's all you've got to do. Now, people I meet, people say to me, well, well, you know, do you, do you wait to get a word for the person? No, I don't, because I've already had it 2,000 years ago. Go and make disciples of all nations. So I don't need a word. I don't need a word about a bad back, a shoulder. I don't need a word about any prophetic word to approach them. I don't need a big hand from the sky. I don't need anything at all. And I'm not being derogatory, I'm being honest. I don't need anything because I know two things are true. This I know one, they're the apple of his eye. And I know two, his desires that none should perish. So I don't need to wait. We have too many people waiting. When the Holy Spirit's like, will you just pedal, man? I'm waiting to take you, and you're just waiting around, waiting for me to tell you something. When I'm ready to take you, just move. So we just move, and we keep moving. Excuse me, can I? No, no problem. Excuse me, can I talk? No, no problem. Excuse me, no. How about you? Excuse me, no. And all the while, you, you're just looking through uh, the apple orchard, walking through, and you're seeing if there's any apples that are ready to fall. That's it. That's all you've got to do. You see, the Great Commission was partnership. What does the gospel mean? What does the word gospel mean? Any of you guys know? Good news. What's the first two letters of gospel? G-O. He's one step ahead of me. What's the first two letters of good? G-O. What's the first two letters of God? G-O. I'm going to tell you this, that everything about Christianity screams, go! We don't need to hang about anymore. There's been too much hanging about. We need to go. If heaven had traffic lights, there'd only be one color. I'm telling you straight. Everything about Christianity is move, 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 go, 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 but we spend too much time waiting. We need to move and we need to partner. When you partner and you pedal, things begin to change. We share, he shakes, we ride, he waits, okay? So all you gotta do, you gotta keep pedaling and you gotta keep reaching out your hand to catch. That's it. Now what makes you a likely candidate. How do, I, how do you know that you're really called for this task? How do you know? Let me explain it. I'm going to show you how. In Luke, uh, let's, let's turn to, if you have a Bible, let's turn to Luke chapter 19. We read the story. I'm, I'm just going to fly through it for time's sake. Luke chapter 19, we read the story, 1 to 9, the story of Zacchaeus. Is there anybody here who is not familiar with the man Zacchaeus who climbed the tree? Anybody at all not familiar? Okay, cool. So are you okay if I skip past it and do a little quick summary. Okay, so we all know about Zacchaeus. Shout some things out to me about Zacchaeus that, that stand in your mind. Thanks. He was short. He was a little man, he was short. Tax collector. Wanted to see Jesus, you guys are smart, okay. He wasn't liked. So Zacchaeus was a tax collector who wanted to see Jesus. That's kind of what we know about him. Now why did he want to see Jesus? What's that? There was excitement. He heard about him. There was a bit of commotion. Okay. I'm going to tell you something here that's really profound. Jesus was on his way, uh, concluding his public ministry in Judea and Galilee, and Zacchaeus was the last encounter. I believe Jesus saved Zacchaeus to the end because it is a profound uh, testimony of a uh, of of a life-changing encounter that Jesus wanted us to get. I believe it's really significant. Many of us, we just know Zacchaeus from the, the Sunday school song, or it's kind of just this light-hearted kind of story that we refer to, but there is so much depth in, in the story of Zacchaeus, and I'm gonna show you what it is. Okay, so Zacchaeus did not have uh, a 15, 20-minute lunch break on, on his tax collector's day. He didn't keep climbing trees because he was a boy that never grew up. There was something more deep 
uh, uh, deeper than that. And it wasn't just that, hey, everyone else is having a look. Man, I may as well have a look too. It was even deeper than that. I'm going to tell you what it was. He was being drawn. And when you're being drawn, something happens to you. You see, all of you guys sitting here, you were once an apple on the tree until somebody caught you. The day that you came to Jesus, somebody caught you. And what happens to apples that are ready to fall but nobody catches them? Guess what happens? They blacken, they decay, just like that one there. They blacken, they decay, and they die. If it's left long enough on the floor, it will just die. And over 160,000 people every day on our planet die. There's apples falling all over the place. And all we're called to do is not to get into some heavy theological debate or to debate science or evolution, but we're called to reach out our hand in partnership with the Spirit and catch, okay? That's what we're called to do. So Jesus is walking through the streets of Jericho and Zacchaeus is being drawn. And as Jesus walks through, Zacchaeus is like, I don't know what's going on, but right now I've got to do anything that I can do to be close to this man. I've got to see, I just have to be close. He was being compelled. He was compelled, sorry, to see. And when you're compelled to see somebody, you'll do anything. You'll do whatever it takes. So that's what he did. So flip, flip, reverse it. What happens? Jesus is walking through the streets of Jericho, okay? Jesus bypasses a lot of people. What do we call people in this context? Apples. So there's a lot of apples, like a huge orchard, because wherever Jesus went, there were crowds. Agreed? Jesus ignores all the crowds, walks straight through, and points to the one apple that is the most unlikely candidate, the most least likely to fall, really, if you think about it. Filthy sinner, like you said, chief tax collector, you know, he wasn't liked. So Jesus bypasses everyone, goes to the man. What does he say? He says nine words. Hurry today. I must come and eat with you. So that's it. And then just like the apple, he comes down the tree. How can that happen from nine words? Go out there this afternoon, stop somebody and say, hurry, can I, I must come and eat with you. <laughs> and then watch what happens. Your eye will probably look like my apple. Because you see, in first century Jewish culture, it made, it made sense. There was context. When you open your home, you open your heart. So what Jesus was asking was this, I want to eat with you. It was an intimate act. I want to come to your home and I want to eat with you. Jesus knew exactly, uh, Zacchaeus knew exactly what was being demanded of him. Jesus cut through everything and he went straight to the heart of the matter. He didn't mess around, he didn't, he didn't skirt around the issue, he didn't spend time in this area. He went straight to the heart of the issue. Son, right here, right now, I want your heart. And what did Zacchaeus say? He said, yeah, okay. And he came down the tree and Jesus said, today salvation has come to, come to this home. How did Jesus know he was ready? I'm going to tell you how. Because when we look at somebody, we look through our earthly lens. When you look at somebody in the street, you think, are they, are they ready for my gospel presentation? You look at the way they're dressed, the way they act, the way they talk and the language they're using, the people they're mixing with. You already make a a preconcept, preconception before you even go over and approach them. You're thinking, man, he's ready, she's ready, she's not ready. Would you agree? We do that in life. Because we're looking through our earthly lens. But when Jesus approaches people, he looks through heaven's lens. And when you look through heaven's lens, this is what happens. Everybody becomes an apple that could fall because everybody's the apple of his eye. So Jesus is not put off by the filthy sinner that nobody likes. He goes straight to that person in partnership with the Spirit, being drawn, being led, knowing where the Father's working, always about the Father's business. Nobody can come unless the Father draws them. So he goes in partnership with the Father, and what happens? The apple falls. And everybody's like, what? You're going to go to the home with that guy? And he ruffles a lot of feathers. We need to start looking through heaven's lens. When I approach an individual, I go over and I believe it's his day until he tells me it isn't. Because I know everybody's right. I know that the harvest fields are ripe. I know that everybody, uh, everyone's the apple of his eye. So I mean, I'm going over with that level of faith, okay? But this is one thing the Holy Spirit showed me. He showed me a school of fish swimming round and round in the deep, dark ocean. Just going round and round and round. And suddenly, this big spotlight came on the fish. And all the fish instantaneously turned to look at the light as the spotlight came out into this deep, dark ocean. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, it's because they've never seen anything like it before. 
And I'm going to tell you this. When Zacchaeus was living his life, going round and round and round, like many do in our communities, they go round and round, living this, doing the same things every day. It doesn't matter if you've got everything. You could be superstar, rich, a millionaire, or you could be on the other end, drug addict, sitting in, a, in an alleyway with nothing. But all we're doing is going round and round and round. There's only so many cars you can drive. There's only so many pairs of sneakers you can wear. There's only, only so much drugs you can take, whatever it may be, or everything in the middle. There is something missing until we find Jesus. We're going round and round and round, chasing our tail, okay? But we're doing it in the darkness until the spotlight comes on. So for Zacchaeus, he was going round and round. Suddenly the spotlight comes on, and like a moth to a flame, he's like, I have to do whatever I've got to do to get close to that light. That's what happened. So Jesus was called the light of the world. You're familiar with that? And what did he say that you are? The light of the world. So that means this. If somebody up a tree can be so drawn that they have to do whatever it takes to look and to be close to Jesus, who's the light of the world, then can they not do that to us? I believe yes, because we are the light of the world. I believe we should walk into rooms and light that room up. I believe we should walk through town centers, uh, walk into shopping malls and have people standing and staring at us. I believe it. And I've seen it and it happens and I've encountered it many times. And not because I'm anyone special, but because I own it. Because I know I'm the light of the world. I'm not walking around little old me, you know, uh, little old me. Man, I'm, I'm embracing that. I belong to Jesus. I'm going to look in my eyes and you'll see him. That, that the days of like this false humility are gone. When people, people are dying, we haven't got time for that. Okay, so this is how I know it to be true. Let me explain it to you guys. I went to a basketball game. Now, I don't know much about basketball. We don't have it in Ireland where I come from. But I was invited to go to the Portland Trailblazers basketball game. And I'd never been to a basketball game, never even watched basketball, didn't know anything about it. This guy said, will you come and speak to the players? I'm like, I'll speak to anybody about Jesus. He said, cool, come along, let's do it. So we go, and as we're waiting to speak to the players, they're having like a pre, pre-match warm-up. And I'm just walking around with this guy, uh, the, the chaplain. We're just walking around. And there's a guy by the court, by the basketball court. And he says, hey, you, come over here. That's my American accent. Come over here. And I'm thinking, is this guy talking to me? He says, you, with the jacket, come on. So I'm like, is he talking to me? And and my friend's like, yeah, 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 go go on over. So we walk over. And I go over and the guy is like fixated on my jacket. He's like, where did you get this jacket? This is like the best thing I've ever seen. Where do you buy it from? What size is it? You know, asking all these questions. So I give him the the, uh, website address for for the jacket. And he's like, thanks so much. And then I realized... It's not the jacket. I'm the light of the world. Now, I didn't know who this guy was. He could have been the cleaner for all I know. So what happens is I pulled out my phone. I said, hey, can I show you this picture? Do you ever pray? He says, well, sometimes. I began to walk him through Jesus at the door, the nine steps the Holy Spirit gave me. It takes about two minutes. And as I'm going through it, <clears throat> I get excited like I do with anybody because I could see the guy was responding. So we get to the end uh, uh, where we pray for them to feel the Holy Spirit. We call it the Zacchaeus moment right here, right now. I say, you know, if Jesus were here right now, would you let him in? And he was like, yeah. So I pray for him. He feels the Holy Spirit. I have a word of knowledge for this guy. Now, as all this is going on, I'm starting to notice there's a little commotion around me. You've got like people kind of TV camera. She's kind of coming over looking, photographer. There's like people milling around, getting very interested. But I'm just in my zone that I don't let it affect me. So the last thing. You're going this way without Jesus. And I'm on the basketball court now demonstrating my last point. They're pre-match warm-up and I'm on the court myself. You're going this way without Jesus. You've got to turn around, change direction and follow him. Do you want to follow him? It's called repentance. He said, yes, I do. So I pray for this guy to accept Jesus. I give him a hug and we walk away. And as we're walking away, the chaplain is like, I can't believe it. He's the superstar player. And he's absolutely about to burst because he's so excited that this guy is the superstar player in the basketball team. I didn't know that, but it's the power of the gospel. And I'm going to tell you this. He was drawn to me because I'm the light of the world. Now, this guy's got trainers, sneakers with his name written on them. This guy's got like everything uh, that any person would probably want, material-wise, materialism-wise. But there is one thing he hasn't got. A relationship with Jesus because he's going round and round and round and round but suddenly in the basketball court just another day playing basketball every week playing basketball 
the spotlight comes on. What is this? I don't know what it is, but, but I need to get close to this. I need to be around this. this hey, come over here. That's what happens. When you're the light of the world, that's what happens. People will want to be around you and want to talk to you and want to be close to you. So I messaged this guy on Instagram. I found him. Four million followers. I'm like, man, basketball's a big deal over here, yeah? <laughs> so I messaged him. Within two minutes, he messages, messages me back. He said, Scott, thank you for praying for me. Thank you for, for what you did. Did I message him because he was a basketball player? No. I messaged him because I do that with every single person I lead to the Lord. Within one hour, I follow them up with a message, with a phone call. It's called making a disciple. You can't make a disciple if you never see him again. Okay, there's so much I could say. <laughs> Is this helpful? Yeah. Okay, let me talk about this. John chapter 4, verse 35, and then I will... And then we're going to go through the, the card, okay? John chapter 4, verse 35. This is the key scripture for what Jesus at the door is built around. It's about sowing and reaping. And I hope you guys, I hope it didn't offend anybody with what I spoke about earlier on. But I'm just trying to, I, I get a little frustrated when I see so many people happy to just pray for the sick and not lead them to Jesus. It just strikes a chord with me when I believe that we can do both. I believe that we sow in order to reap. But I meet too many people and they're just sowing and they're happy with it and they think it's okay because they got wowed. But we need them to get wooed because that's how our lives get changed, okay? So John chapter four, verse 35, this is what happened. Jesus speaks to his disciples. In fact, does anybody have John four thirty-five? Yeah, could you shout it out? Oh, I'd love to hear your voice. Do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. So Jesus said to his disciples, do you not say four months? Four months and then comes the harvest. That's called sowing. You have a way of doing things. You have an order of doing things. And it takes a certain amount of time. It's not instant. It's called sowing. But then Jesus says this. He says, but if you open your eyes and see... So not just, just go and get it, but there's something required from the participant. There's something required. It's eyes to be opened. These eyes, no. Looking through a different lens. If you see, if you open your eyes and see, the fields are white for harvest. Now what that means is you don't have to wait four weeks, or four months, four weeks, four days, or four hours, but you can have it right now. That's called the harvest. It's ready. And it's those apples that are so low that if you don't move your head, it will hit you on the head. And I'm going to tell you, I've experienced this. Everything I'm telling you comes from first-hand experience. I was in my community, and I, was, uh, this, this, I just had Jesus at the door. It was just given to me by the Spirit, and I began to use it within weeks. Uh, weeks. So I stopped this guy, and I'm like, hey, excuse me, man, you ever see this picture? Do you ever pray? He's like, yes, I pray. And I'm like, great. Uh, I want to let him in, is what he said, this guy. I'm like, excuse me? I, I want to let him in, yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's great. Let me, I'll just carry on and let you know what, what it's about, yeah? So Jesus is knocking on, the, on, your, on your heart and the handle's on the inside, but you're the only one who can let him in. Yeah, I know, I want to let him in, is what this guy said to me. His, his name was Michael, he was from Bulgaria. So I'm thinking maybe it's like a language issue or something, you know? So, so I'm kind of speaking a little slower and making sure he, he's getting me, you know what I mean? He's understanding. I'm like, so, you know, if you had a, a bag on your back and, and it was heavy, and I'm kind of doing this, you know, not meaning to be rude, but, you know, sometimes you can do that if you don't think someone's understanding you. So I'm explaining the whole thing, and he's looking at me like I'm an idiot. Uh, and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to let him in. <laughs> so he's speaking to me as if I don't understand him. I want to let him in. So I'm thinking, this is going nowhere. It was like some kind of, it was like some comic sketch. It was like, it was like something from... Uh, what do you call that old show? Yeah, it's like some kind of John Cleese thing, Forty Towers or something. So anyway, I'm thinking, okay, this is going nowhere. So I tried one more. You know, if you had a, a debt with the bank and you, I would like to let him in. I'm like, okay, let's just pray. So I'm just thinking this guy's yanking my chain, but let's just go for it anyway. So we pray. I'm like, God bless you, sir. And I follow up with the guy. His name was Michael. I baptized him in the sea. And I'm going to tell you why. Because it is harvest time. Last night, I have a Tuesday night group. I have a Tuesday night group every Tuesday in Woodland, Washington. You're like, where's that? I thought the same. It's a tiny little town, 
People only know it because they pass through it on the way somewhere. But it's a tiny town of like 5,000 people, but I'm based at a wonderful church there called the Promise Church. And every Tuesday, I invite anybody with a pulse to come and learn how to share the gospel. So we go out every Tuesday and we lead people to the Lord. So we're there last night, and just an example, and we stop like, uh, I'm with these two ladies training them. They're super nervous, never done it before. Um, in fact, let me tell you this quickly. So one of the ladies who came, she, her name's Angela. I was in a local cafe three months ago in January and led her to the Lord in a local cafe with a guy that I was, a, a, a guy that I was discipling on how to follow up how not just to pray for people, but how to make a disciple. That was what I was doing with them. So as we're there, she caught my eye. She worked in the cafe. I led her to the Lord, and then she came to church the next day after I followed up with her, and she began coming ever since. So last night she came with a boyfriend to, uh, to learn how to share the gospel. Her name was Angela. So, what the, so I'm with Angela and this other lady. We're walking around. We stopped five people, and they're all like, no, not interested. No, no. So I could see the two ladies were getting a little, you know, they were a little deflated. Because the five people had said, I'm not interested. Oh, no. And I, and I said to them, I tried to explain. I said, look, it's okay. You know, we're not the shakers. We just share. It's fine. And I explained how one day I stopped 20 people. I said, it's okay. We just keep going. We walk around the corner, walk around the aisle. I see a lady straight away, discerned that she's ready. Because sometimes, you know, when you work with apples, you get to know them. Jesus worked with sheep, and he got to know them. If a shepherd can look at 100 sheep and pick them all out by name. When you work with apples, you get to know, and, and you also get to know the Holy Spirit. So I'm like, okay, she's ready. I just know it. So I walk over to the lady, go through Jesus at the door, lead her to the Lord. As I'm doing that, Angela goes to her fiance, who's waiting at the back watching, and goes and leads him to the Lord. Yeah. So then I, get it, I message the lady, and she messages me back this morning saying, we're really excited to come to your new believers group tomorrow night in our home. We meet every single Thursday night. Now, I'm just giving you one example. Another person, Angela, goes and leads to Jesus. Two people she led to the Lord. First time she's ever done it. I'm just telling you, there is a harvest field that is ready if you step into it. But if you stay here in the sowing ground and you just keep sowing and sowing and sowing your socks off, what's going to happen is you're going to get bored and frustrated and think nobody wants to know Jesus. Some people we have to sow. The kingdom of God is made up of sowing and reaping. I'm not saying one is better. I'm saying we need even scales. At the moment, we have a, a lot of sowing and not much reaping. But we need to balance the scales. So Jesus is saying this. Don't wait four months when you can have it right now. Sowing and reaping. But what do you do? You go to people. You approach them through the power and the partnership of the Holy Spirit. And you let the Lord do the rest. It's quite simple. Okay, would you like to know how this thing works? Okay, so if we can hand out cards, um, or I'll tell you what, or you can come and get them. So here's the cards here. You guys don't have them, do you? So let's, let's, let's give these out. Or what's the best way to do it? Okay. So that should be enough. If there's not enough, we have more at the back. So Jesus at the door is a reaping tool. Nine points, it's framed around nine points in a picture. There's the picture. And nine points on the back. Okay? It's broken into three sections. The first three points we call the blue zone for obvious reasons. Because it's orange. We call it the blue zone. The blue zone has three points that pertain to the picture. Then we go on to the next three points we call that the red zone. Those three points symbolize sin. And then lastly, we go on to the yellow zone. Those three points reveal repentance. So it's bro broken into three sections. If you need some more, there is some more on our table out there that, that the lady will help you out. Okay, three sections. The picture, sin, and repentance. That's it. So when we approach an individual, we're going to ask them, we're going to say to them, uh, we're going to ask permission to speak to them. Why do you think it's good to ask for permission? It's respectful. Exactly. Okay. So it's respectful. Now, respectful, being respectful is good. But, it's, but there's a deeper reason than that. Now, I want everything that I, that I say to you guys, I want you to kind of uh, um, picture it. I want you to filter it through the Captain Stoker 
shaker, a share a shaker uh, imagery. Is that cool? I just want you guys to, to, like everything I'm teaching, I want you to imagine it as like the Holy Spirit's your captain, you're behind them, you're sharing, he's shaking. I want that concept to really go deep within you so that you're understanding that you're behind him in everything that you do, that he's leading the way. Okay, when I stop an individual, excuse me, can I ask you a quick question? That's kind of what I ask. It's not on the card. I believe you're intelligent enough to remember. Can I ask you a quick question? That's all I'm asking. No, I'm not really interested. I don't have time. Well, hang on, let, let, me, let me, I really want to ask you. No, I'm not going to say that. Do you know why? I believe this. If they were being drawn, they would stop for me. Now, if I was doing this in my own strength, then I need to bring out the sales pitch. I need to bring out the silver tongue. I need to kind of, in some way, get this guy to, you know, to stop for me. But we're not doing that. Everything we're doing is through the lens of the captain. Everything. I don't try and sell anything. I'm not trying to push anyone over the line. I'm not trying to cajole anyone. I'm not trying to get some number. Man, I'm not interested in that. I'm only interested in making disciples. And how can I make disciples? They have to be drawn. If they're not being drawn, like I said earlier, don't even waste your time. I'm looking for those that are being drawn. It's partnership with the Spirit, okay? It's a different way of doing evangelism for some. So I stop him. Excuse me, can I ask you a question? Yes, you may. I'm going to carry on. I know he's, he's okay for this part. Let's go. Have you ever seen this picture before and do you ever pray? That's what I'm going to ask him. Have you ever seen the picture before or do you ever pray? Now, obviously, most people in a new area like this, they're not have going to see the picture, but that's okay. Even if they say, yeah, yeah, I've seen it, that's, that's fine. You're just using that line as your way of, uh, of showing them the image. Now, the Lord has anointed this image powerfully. We've seen and I've, test, I've had testimonies from people who've come to me and told me that people have looked at this image and began to cry and get saved. I know one personal story, if I had time, I would share, you, I'd share it with you. A whole family of five that I baptized began from uh, the lady looking at the picture and began to, began to cry. So the Lord has really anointed this image. But we're just asking that. We're just getting the image right out there. And let me tell you why it's good also for you. If you're nervous, then what you can do is you can just let them fix, fix their eyes on that image and you can catch your breath. If you go over with nothing, hey, can I talk to you about Jesus? They're like eyeballing you, you're eyeballing them. It's awkward for everybody. But you've got this and you can just say, hey, and people will like to refer, like look to defer and look at that because it makes them feel a little less awkward. And then you ask them, do you ever pray? No, man, I, I, I don't pray. I never pray. What about in emergencies? As you, you guys can see, you can follow this with me. What about in emergencies? Would you pray in an emergency? If somebody was dying in the family, a real crisis situation, would you pray? No, I'm not, I'm not interested in all that. Do you believe God is there? So this is where we go. Now, if they say, yeah, I pray, we don't need to obviously go through in emergencies. Do you believe God is there? This is if, if the people aren't going along with you, okay? Again, we're just trying to figure out, is this somebody that's being drawn? The whole point of this card is to find out, as you move on your bike, is my captain stopping here? That's it. That's all we're trying to figure out. Is my captain stopping here? No, he's not. Cool, let's keep moving. Let's keep pedaling. Is he stopping here? No, let's keep pedaling. That's all we're doing through every single point. Is my captain on this? Is my captain stopping here? That's it, okay? So let's presume that they pray, or let's presume they believe in God. We continue. If they, don't, if they say no to everything, honestly, I'm going to say, unless the Spirit gives me a word otherwise, I'm going to say, God bless you, have a great day, and I'm moving on. Because I don't want you to be stood with, for 30 minutes with one of these apples that isn't going to fall, no matter what you do, isn't being drawn, and what, what's going to happen is going to suck you of your energy and the life that's out of you, and it will turn into some kind of res, verbally, verbal wrestling match, which is no good for anybody. What I would rather do is you use those 30 minutes to catch the three apples that you could have. But the devil will send these red herrings to stop you being in the harvest fields. He likes to keep you here to stop you going over there. And you see, when apples are ready to fall and nobody catches them, they die. Or they fall into the wrong hands. Some wacky religion, some cult, some sect. It's important that we catch these apples instead of overthinking it and going to Bible college for 20 years before we even open our mouths. Okay, we need to be ready. Every single believer, be ready. Okay, this is Jesus. We explain what the picture is. This is Jesus. He's knocking at the door of your heart. The handle's on the inside. Only you can let him in. We immediately lay down the foundations for our, our conversation. And then we go to the next point. Now, lots of people pray, and praying is like talking through the door. You know he's there somewhere, but you don't know him personally. Now, how many people do you know who know God is there 
but they don't know him personally. It's called religion. This is what I like to explain to, to people. Religion happens outside the door, and relation ha relationship happens inside the door. There's lots of people who are having, uh, who have this religion outside the door. They're like, well, yeah, he, you know, he, he, I know he's there. I, I know about God. Yeah, I pray before I go to sleep or whatever it may be, okay? It's called religion. But when it becomes relationship is when it comes inside the door, when, when you let Jesus in. So this is just for you guys, by the way. I'm not, you don't need to say this to people. I'm just trying to show you there's a distinction between uh, religion and relationship. And we make it quite a lot through this card, okay? So lots of people pray, you know, he's there, but you don't know him personally. Now, if I stopped you on the street and I said, you don't know Jesus personally, what would you say to me? If I stopped you on the street and said, you don't know Jesus personally, what would be your response? Exactly. So how do we know if somebody's a Christian? Well, there's one, there's one point where they can out themselves. So there's a few significant moments during this card when people say, well, yeah, you know, uh, he might be a believer. Well, if he was a believer, instead of saying, are you a believer? Which is what people do. They, they don't stick to that. They're like, do you ever pray? Yeah. Oh, are oh, you a believer? Yeah, I am. Oh, great. Have a nice day. The devil's a believer. So just because they believe and just because they pray, that's not licensed to walk away. We must pr persist. We must continue. The whole point of this card is that the Holy Spirit's working on the inside as you're on the outside. It's partnership, okay? We have to tackle the subjects that are on there. Okay, so we move on. You don't know him personally. It's designed to provoke a response. Everything on this card provokes a response, for good or bad. And for good, I mean, if you're a believer, well, yeah, of course I know him personally. That's great. Praise God. Have a great day, brother. And then you go and catch your apples. You find out where the believers are. Or you don't know him personally. And the religious person is like, well, you know, that's a fair point. I don't. It's provoking something in everybody, okay? Okay, now we're going to the red zone, which is all about sin. Visualize wearing a backpack. If we filled it with all your sins, would it be heavy? No, I've never sinned. I am, I am like an angel incarnate. I make Mother Teresa look filthy. Now, obviously, people wouldn't say that, but what I'm, what I'm trying to accentuate is that people, some people are going to say, no, I, I don't think so. I, I'm a good person. I've never sinned. If they tell you that, this is what they're doing. They're just saying this. That's me done. That's all they're doing. They're saying, hey, I'm, I'm out of this. I, I, I exit. I'm done. They know full well that they're a sinner. They know they're not perfect. But they're just saying to you, this is, this is it for me, Okay. Now, do we sit them down and say, well, hang on, hang on. You, you maybe don't understand the question. Uh, let me tell you what a filthy sinner you are. And for the next 10 minutes, you dissect every area of their lives and present the sin before them. Do you do that? No. no. Now, you could if you were flying solo. And I've heard evangelism techniques like that, where they tell the people uh, how much of a sinner they are. But when you're partnering with the Spirit in a reaping tool, we don't do that. Do you know why? Because John chapter 16, verse 8 says this, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of its sin. So I would rather let my captain do it than me do it. Simple as that. Again, you don't need anything but what you have. You have everything in the Spirit and the Gospel, everything you need to, to lead people to Jesus. That's it. Would there be anything in your bag? Well, yeah, there'd be something, and I guess everybody would. Exactly, everybody would have something in their bag. That's your debt with God. It, it represents your debt with God. It stops you having a relationship with him. And that's what he wants. He doesn't want your religion. Again, making that clear distinction between the two, okay? If you owe the bank, and the, these are all these points, by the way, just to clarify, they're all um, imagery-laden examples. So they're, like, they're all about like the image. People can picture it. When Jesus spoke, he spoke in parables, didn't he? It was all images. It was just simple stuff that people could picture. And that's what this card is, okay? If you owe the bank $10,000 and I wrote you a check for that, I'll give you a check for that amount, you deposited it into your account, what would happen to your debt? Is that a difficult question? You're looking at me like, it's quite difficult, yeah. <laughs> you don't need an IQ of 160 to answer that question. If you wrote, had the debt and I wrote the check and you go and cash it in, my debt's gone. Yeah, okay, it's cleared. And that's exactly what Jesus did for you on the cross. He wrote you a check signed in his blood. And today he's standing at the door of your heart asking where you cash in him. Simple stuff. Okay, 
The blue zone and the red zone are what we call sowing. So this is, we're here right now. Blue and the red. This is where we are in the sowing fields, okay? And then what do we do? How do we get over there? So when the Holy Spirit gave me the red and uh, the blue and the red zone, I'm thinking, yeah, you know, it was amazing. It was life-changing. People were responding. But then it came to a point where I was like, but how do I? Because up until that point, it was, hey, come to church. Uh, come along to church. Uh, come on Sunday. And I'm thinking, they'll come to church and, you know, the worship team will, will bring the presence of God. The pastor will get up and deliver a word and do an altar call. That was where I was at generally. I didn't know you could lead someone to the Lord in two minutes. Is that even legal? That's kind of what I'm thinking. So I'm in this place here and I'm thinking, but I really want to get over here. I really want to be a reaper. And it's, they, seem so, they seem ready. I just didn't know how to present it to them. And then the Holy Spirit said this. He showed me the Zacchaeus moment. If Jesus were here right now, would you let him in? So that's where it becomes a reaping tool. If Jesus were here right now, would you let him in? And as I said it, I remember the, the man, he said, yes, I would. And I thought, oh no. You see, I believe Jesus is here now. Who believes Jesus is here now? Hallelujah. That's a good sign. But I can't prove it to you. I can share my testimony. I can tell you what God has done in my life. But that is not proof. But there is one who reveals Jesus. Who is it? Holy Spirit, your captain. So what do we do? We get out of the way and let your captain be the captain. Hey, can you see the wind? No. But you can feel it, yeah? Jesus is here right now, just like the wind. Can I pray for you to feel his presence? And then I prayed, not knowing, honestly, not knowing what was going to happen. Again, all I'd known up until that point was was window dressing. All I'd known up until that point, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but all I mean is that I'd had these other things to wow them. I didn't know the gospel alone could wow them and could woo them, both together in one. I didn't know that could happen. So I stepped out, and I was so nervous, and I said, Holy Spirit, it's over to you. And I prayed, Lord, let them feel you. Let them know you're here right now. And my greatest weakness became my greatest strength. The moment when I gave all control to the Spirit is when I saw the most beautiful things happen. Grown men crying in the street. Wind circling people. Just like miracles. Because you see, when you give all control, he can take full control. And evangelism is about how out of control you can get. It's crazy. It's like counterintuitive. You think, well, hang on, I've got, to, I've got to be in control of this. The only reason you, you try to own your evangelism is because you're scared. And you don't want to be vulnerable. And you want to feel secure. So what you do is you own it. You get tight onto it. You hold on tight to it. But what you're doing is negating the very power that your partnership with the Holy Spirit affords you. Because you're owning it and you're controlling it. You've got to get out of control and let him get in control. That's when it becomes power. Trust me. And I didn't know, but I found it in the moment. That was the moment right there that became my favorite moment and still is. Because I'm giving everything to the Spirit. And I began to see the people would encounter him. And then I would say this. Can you tell me uh, what you felt there? And they'd say, well, yeah, I felt, I felt this. And sometimes they're, they're weeping. It's clear to tell. But what did you feel like? I felt this like butterflies, my heart was racing, I felt tingling, whatever it may be, they felt God's presence. Would you believe that he's here from that encounter? Yes, I would. Okay. Now the last thing, turn from the road you're on without Jesus, change direction and follow him. Do you want to follow him? It's called repentance. If we share the gospel without repentance, it's not a full gospel. It's a ticket to heaven and we're not giving out tickets to heaven. If they don't count the cost, it ain't going to work, which is why we save it to the end. That's the most important thing. And I have people say to me, I like it all apart from that last bit. And I say, well, that's okay, but I'm not going to pray for you right now. I want to invite you to my church. I want to invite you to hang out for a coffee. Let's just get to know. Let's talk more about this. But right now, you're not really ready. And that's okay. Because without repentance, it's nothing. They have to want. It's like falling in love. If you don't want it, it ain't going to happen. I can't make you fall in love. That's a heart issue. 
No matter what anybody does, they can't make you give your heart. You've got to choose it. It's a choice you need to make, but we present it fully, okay? So you pray for them. So I just want to back up, and I'm going to look at a couple of these things just as we go through it, and then we're going to demo it and get you guys on a little practice. So if you pray for the person, uh, can, can I pray for you to feel, and you pray for them, and then nothing happens? What if you pray and nothing happens? Well, this is what I've found. I've found there are two reasons why people don't feel the Holy Spirit. And I've done this thousands of times, uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands probably in, in different nations. Why? These are the reasons why. One, they are just not ready. The person is just not ready, and that's okay. And two, they have a deep-rooted hurt that they're not willing to, to kind of allow themselves to feel because they're really hurting some deep issue. So this is how you get around it. The first way is this. You ask them, do you have enough faith to believe God is here right now, that Jesus is here right now? You see, there's two things we need to come to the Lord. Grace and faith. The grace is there. We're just checking if they've got the faith. So do you have enough faith to believe? No, no not really. That's, that's, that tells me the person's not ready. But if it's a deep-rooted hurt, then they would say, yeah. But what we want to do in this is we want to address that hurt. And how do we do it? Word of knowledge. Jesus at the door is a garden where all your other gifts can grow. But you don't need them to begin. But I promise you this. As you step out in this tool, I promise you, this will make you more fruitful than you've ever been. And I have that much confidence in it. And I've seen it in different nations and different people. However fruitful you are right now, as a soul winner, this will make you more fruitful. Now you're like, that's very arrogant. No, it's not because I didn't make it up. I was just a conduit for the Spirit to give me this. And I believe it, and I've seen uh, people's lives change. I've seen communities change through it. I've seen um, amazing things. It will make you more fruitful if you'll have the faith to step into it. I moved in words of knowledge 5% my first year on the streets, first nine months. Year number two, I'm at 95% word of knowledge, which means pretty much everyone I'm stopping, I'm getting a clear word of knowledge from. How did that happen? Did I read books on words of knowledge? Did I go to conferences on words of knowledge and certain the prophets? I didn't have time. Five days a week, I'm on a street leading people to the Lord. This is what I did. I got to know my captain. You see, if I go on a bike ride, if me and you go on a bike ride for 10 minutes once a month, and me and you go for two hours once a month, who do you think I'm going to be closer with? Because I've spent more time with this, with this gentleman. When you spend time with the Holy Spirit, something's going to happen. You're going to become like him. You're going to know how he feels, how he thinks. So will all those other gifts that I referred to earlier on, will they grow? Yes, they will. Healing will grow. Prophetic will grow. It's, it has to happen because it's who he is. He's the healer. He's the prophet. He's the evangelist. It will happen. It will flow out of you so naturally. But the beauty of it is this. It's going to happen in a fluid motion, not in sitting on the sidelines saying, I need that before I can begin. All you need is the gospel. Does that make sense? Okay, then we pray for the person and we lead them in a prayer. Uh, people say to me, because I know some people are a bit offended by the prayer these days, why do you pray? This is why I pray. I pray so that a non-believer who's just become a, about to become a believer can verbalize what is going on in their heart right now in this moment. And also because what we read in Romans where if you confess with your mouth uh, that what you've believed in your heart, then you will be saved. So I believe there's power in the spoken word. So that's why it's not a magic formulatic prayer. It's just a prayer that enables them to articulate some of what is going on in their heart right now is what we pray with them, okay? And that's it. Okay, so let's have a few questions and then I'm going to get you guys to pair up. I'm going to have a go at it and then we're going to go and uh, lead some folks to the Lord. And then before we do that, I'm just going to touch a quick five minutes on follow-up, and then we're going to go and do it. Is that cool? So anything at all that you're thinking, and I'm not offended easily, so please don't hold back. If you're thinking something, don't agree with this, or that's good, that's bad, please just bring it to the open. Yes, my love. Yeah, yeah, good point. Okay. So for me, I mean, I, and you know, I'm trying to kind of, there's so much to this, like, like, People kind of hear about this tool and they think it's just a, you just kind of stand there, it's just a card, which you do, but there's a lot behind it, which is why I'm trying to give you, you know, uh, give you the best. Of, of. Yeah, so this card here, let me, let me explain it this way. The three biggest rules, there's three 
biggest rules when you go into the streets that I want you to remember. Number one, read the card. Read it. Now, unless you're some kind of genius, you ain't going to be able to memorize that in five minutes, ten minutes. So I want you to read it. I don't want you to kind of just remember it and jumble it up. And I want you to just read it, okay? Now, you're going to feel awkward about reading this card. Everything inside of you will say, don't read the card. <laughs> I promise you. When you get out there, there'll be this little voice that says, don't read it, don't read it, don't read it. It's, it's that kind of strong. Because you, you want to be like relational, you want to be friendly, and you, you'll feel weird standing there reading the card. Please, when you go out there this afternoon, listen to my voice that says, read the card. I'm going to be the angel on the shoulder as the other devil saying, don't read the card, don't read the card, okay? I saw an 11-year-old girl in Oklahoma, my first ministry trip in the US. 11-year-old girl comes to my training, so timid and so shy, she wouldn't even look at me, she was kind of like this. I'm thinking, why is she here? I don't understand. She goes onto the streets. She stands here with the card. She looks at the lady after every one of the three sections. She reads the card so eloquently and beautifully and confidently. After every section looks up, at the end the lady burst out crying and got saved. I'm gonna tell you this. It is not the power of your presentation that leads to salvation, it is the power of the gospel. So don't you worry about how you present it, but please just deliver the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation, okay? I promise you it works. So just read it. Yes. Okay, good question. Now the only people, and this is not a comment against you, but the only people who address the issue of sin so far that I've ever met have been believers. Believers get a little uncomfortable about non-believers when they mention the word sin and blood. They kind of think, well, honey, you can't really talk about blood. You can't really talk about sin. I'm going to tell you this. Sin is a word that has transcended cultures. Rappers rap about it. Singers sing about it. It's kind of one of those funny words that it's just, it's kind of remained in, in culture. But if you meet someone who doesn't know what sin is, now I've never met them and I'm not saying they don't exist. But if you do, just, just explain it is the things you've done wrong in God's eyes. So it's, it's all the things you've done wrong in God's eyes. But it's crazy, and it baffled me. I've got to be honest, it did baffle me. But I kept coming again. Even young people, I'm like, you sin. And I'm waiting to give a backup answer. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. So, and then I remember hearing, like, even like three years ago, or two years ago, there was a song in the charts in the UK anyway. Got to number one. We talked about sin. Uh, honestly, it's, it's just a word that is, is it kind of, it's remained in culture. Um, but, yeah, good question. Okay, yeah. Yeah, good point. So, so it's kind of like the first, the first question, uh, have you seen this picture before? So when you, when you say that, they immediately focus on it. But really what you want to ask them, that's just kind of your way in uh, to show them the, the image. But what you really want to ask is, do you ever pray? So, so it's kind of like, it, I'm not going to say it's throwaway because it's not. It's, it's important, but it's, it's leading you into the next question. Have you seen it? But what you really want to is like, do you pray? So that's just the introduction, if you like. Introduction to the question. But yeah, good question. Yeah. Um, so I'm a little bit of an experienced alcoholic all the way because I'm not maybe just for me personally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good point, yeah. So what we're trying to do, I mean, we're not trying to, you know, th let, me, let me explain it this way as well. If you can talk somebody into being a Christian, someone else can talk them out of it, okay? So, so obviously we're not, this is not about uh, um, levels of, uh, of text or, or, you know, it's about an encounter with the Holy Spirit, which again, Jesus used nine words. Hurry today, I must come and eat with you. We, we use nine points and he lives inside of us. So I believe if he used nine words, then we can use nine points if he lives inside of us. So some people have a problem with the, sp the, the how, how short this is. It takes, it's too quick. But I believe that Zacchaeus was quick. I believe that if Jesus is in us and he's working through his Holy Spirit, he's working in that person's life, I believe two minutes is enough. What we're doing is we're presenting a, a gospel, but that is not going to uh, enable them to live for the next 10 years because they need discipleship. It's called the church. 
we're, we're meant to be in it together. So nobody gets saved and then you say, okay, see you in 10 years or see you in heaven because that's just the first bit. That's the first beginning. So let me put it this way. Billy Graham said, this is what Billy Graham said, the 5% effort it takes to win somebody to Christ finishes when they pray. The 95% effort to bring them into maturity as a disciple within the church begins. Now, what we've been doing at Jesus at the Door for the past three years is we've been working on the 5%. And the reason is, is because there's 96% who aren't doing this. So we've been focusing on that. But now, this past year or so, we've been leaning into the, the 95% of discipleship making. That's something we've really been honing in on. Uh, now, that's another training in itself, which I don't, I don't have time to tackle fully today. But we have, uh, we have these follow-up cards here. So when somebody gets saved, uh, we don't just shake their hand and say, see you in heaven. What we do is we leave them with a card. On the back, you've got the congratulations. You've got uh, three points. Read the Bible, get connected to a church or new believers group, and tell someone about the decision you made and a great link that they can watch. So you're leaving with this. This, this rips off. You're leaving with their name, uh, their uh, phone number, and this, all the social media. So if you're going to be intentional about being, making disciples, then you need, we need to help you with that. Um, so the card's going to help you be intentional about leading them, and this is going to be intentional about following up, okay? Um, so in answer to your question, it, it, all, the, all those questions that they have, if they do have them, will not take place on that one moment, but it's called uh, relationship. So for instance, I led those guys, um, I led a, a guy last two weeks ago to the Lord and Walmart Tuesday night group. On a Tuesday, on Thursday, he's at my house, doesn't really know anything about anything. We start praying, we, sh we, we do what we do, and he's like weeping as he feels the, the touch of the Holy Spirit. So we, you know, we try and explain a little about what's going on and what you're feeling. So that's going to happen in a new believer group or in church on a Sunday or through relationship as like you having a coffee with them as a friend. Making disciples is making friends. So you've got it, but it's going to cost you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to invade your life. It's going to cost you time, your energy, your money. It's going to, you know, you, you're going to have to be serious about it. It's no good just leading someone to the Lord and saying, have a nice life, see you in heaven. That's not what this is about. I'm, I'm teaching you the 5%, but we need this to begin. But we have each other to, to, to work out the 95, okay? There's plenty of people in your church who will be able to help you. I'm sure will, it will give their time and energy to help make a disciple. Does that answer it? Okay, but it's a good question. Yeah. Seventy-two would be way too long for me. Okay, let me tell you why. If you get, who's been a believer for ten years or more? Okay, so you've been a believer for ten years or more. Does the devil ever resist you still in your walk with Jesus? Okay, ten years a believer. What's your name, sir? Ted. Okay, Ted's been a believer for more than 10 years. The devil still comes against him. So there's our new friend here, 10 minutes a believer. Do you think the devil will throw the forces at hell at this person who doesn't know how to resist the, the devil and submit to God, who doesn't know anything about anything, like what you're saying, okay? He doesn't know those things. So we need to get alongside and teach them those things. We need to teach them how to stand against the enemy. We need to start putting some roots down and working with them. So we can't do that if we don't get in touch with them. 72 hours in the life, and I'm not being funny against you, but 72 hours in the life of a brand new believer, man, that's a long time. That's a lot of pounding the devil can do in 72 hours. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, within an hour, two hours max, I'm going to be on that phone, I'm going to be texting them. They don't reply, I'm calling. And what I'm doing is gonna, I'm going to tenaciously fight for them because the devil is tenaciously fighting to bring them back. So we, we, this is what happens. When people do discipleship, this is what happens. They're okay on the tandem bicycle with the Holy Spirit, but then they think, well, okay, now they got saved, I'm just going to hop off. And I'll, I'll just let the Lord take it from here. That's not how discipleship works. We stay on in partnership through the whole process. So in order to do that, your part is to call them, to text them, to reach out to them, to offer to meet them. Whatever it takes, you've got to be creative, and you've got to fight for them. And the way you fight for them is by loving them. Okay? So I would say uh, uh, quite immediately, uh, as soon as you can, I'll be reaching out to, the, to those people. Uh, like the lady last night, as soon as, I, um, as, soon as this morning, because I, I, I got home late, late last night, I didn't. But first thing this morning, 8 a.m., I'm on that phone, I'm texting her about, if she hadn't texted me back, I would be calling her. So I'm going after it because I know that we need to, we need to really show some tenacity with this thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, good question. So what I would say is what you just talked about is, is more of a sewing initiative, okay? Share your testimony, that kind of stuff. Now, there's nothing wrong. It's, it's a wonderful thing to share your testimony. But again, it's back to this thing of the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. You don't need anything but it. So, and this is the reason why. Sometimes you don't have more than a couple of minutes with a stranger, if you're stopping a stranger, okay? You don't really have that long. So you want to deposit the power as soon as you can get it in there. And the power's in the gospel. So, you know, there's power in your testimony, of course, but the power is in that uh, presenting the gospel and then giving them invitation. Now, after they've accepted Jesus, man, you can do whatever you want if, if they're up for it in terms of sticking around. Take them for a coffee right there and then. Share your personal testimony. And I do do that sometimes, but I would do it after. Because I'm thinking if I've got a window, however, uh, however great this window is, I need to introduce, them to introduce them to Jesus. So use that for the gospel, anything else after, pray for the sick, if they, if they need healing, pray for that, uh, share your testimony, you know, whatever it may be, okay, but it's just reordering it, so that that's not what, that's not what we're, we're, we're honing in with, that's not our, our, uh, our center of the message, does that make sense? Okay, good question, yeah. After, after you pray for somebody to accept the Lord, when you don't Yeah, good point. So what I would do, I mean, we can only do what we can do in the, in the moment, you know. I mean, it's down to them if they want to respond. So if that, if that was an instance where they said, I didn't feel anything, but then you present, do you, do you have enough faith to believe? Um, which, you know, if that would be conducive with them accepting the Lord that I've got enough faith to believe. I've never met anyone who says, I don't have enough faith to believe, but yeah, I want to let him in. Do you see what I mean? So obviously they would have to not have enough faith to let him in, but they're still saying, okay, I've let him in, but I don't feel anything, which is what you're getting at. And that's okay, you will, you will. Come along to, to church on Sunday, come along to our new believers group. You know, this isn't about feelings, but you will feel his presence, okay? It is faith, and you've taken hold of it by faith. The feelings will come uh, as, we, as you get to know Jesus. And I've had that before with some of my new believers, and I, I don't feel what he feels. And I'm like, that's okay, you just, you just keep getting to know Jesus, and you, you'll feel his presence, okay? So that will come. So yeah, we don't need to make a, a, that big a deal about that, but we wanna get him plugged in immediately. One thing is sure, one thing for sure is this, the Spirit's not holding back. If they don't feel, it's only on them. There's a reason why they're holding back, okay? So we just need to kind of journey that with them and find out. Maybe it's a deep hurt or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. No, not in this particular. Car. I mean, I mean, everything I've just taught you there came. Uh, the, the Lord gave me this tool, then gave me the revelation behind it. So everything I've just taught you there came after I had this. I didn't know why it why it was. I just obe obeyed the Lord and uh, and uh, went for it. So everything I've just shared is the revelation behind it. Which obviously there were some scriptures like Zacchaeus, John four thirty five. But honestly, like what what happens is we feel we have to pad things out as believers. So even when I teach people this, they don't just read it. A lot of people are like, they'll go like round instead of going straight. Because we just like to waffle a bit. We feel the more words, the more concrete it's gonna be. But again, what you're doing is you're trying to compensate for, for the spirit. So we don't need to, so uh, the, the Bible verses, all that kind of stuff, you know, just let that come after. Uh, you, don't, you, know, you don't need anything but the gospel, and that's what this is. So if you, are, if you wanna like, obviously you wanna get them reading the Bible first, right off the bat, that's really important. But in terms of what they're doing right now, this moment here is, is them meeting Jesus. That's kind of what's happening. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a big detailed thing to meet Jesus. It's a simple, you're a sinner and I want your heart. Will you follow me? That's kind of it. What did Jesus say to his disciples? Hey, come follow me. It was, it was quick. It was simple. It was short. It wasn't a big drawn out thing. But as they followed, they began to become more like him. 
because you follow and you, be, you just become more like him. So, you know, I think maybe for some of you guys, what you're going to have to do is take this by faith a little because, like, it does happen with a lot of people I train and they kind of look at it and they're like, really, is that it? And, th- and then they go and say, I had a guy at my training a month ago and he actually said it and my training's like, this, 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 this is, this is it. And, and I, you know, again, I love this honesty. I'm like, yeah, yeah. So we talked about it and, and then we went into, we went into uh, Walmart, again, my Tuesday night group. Uh, I said, you're coming with me, this guy. So he came with me. The second person I stopped was a builder, a laborer, 24 year old uh, lad. So just shit, went through it, like got through like four points. The guy starts crying. And he comes and he hugs me in the middle of Walmart by the entertainment section. He hasn't even got saved yet and he's hugging me as the power of God touches him. Now, needless to say, my new friend was sold because what he saw was the power of God at work. Now, if you take away the Holy Spirit, you've got a guy with a colored out face and a few colored patch, uh, zones with a few words. That's it. But when you uh, align it with the Holy Spirit, which this is, it's explosive. You see, the gospel is like a sledgehammer. And what the gospel does, when we share the gospel, we're taking a sledgehammer to the wall around people's hearts. Every lie, every proud argument the devil has built up, all the, all the hurts, we're going in with a sledgehammer and we're cracking that thing down. For some believers, what they do, they view the gospel more like a feather and they're like tickle their ear or something with it, you know? But this thing is power, but you're only going to realize the power in it when you step out alone naked with it, honestly. When you're not hiding behind anything else. No fancy schemes or programs or whatever. You just step out bare alone with a simple gospel and trust in the Holy Spirit, which is going to feel weird for you at first until you get used to it. But only then will you see a raw power of God move, I promise you. But it's going to take faith. Yes, young man. Good question. So if somebody, if somebody starts arguing with you and they start, you know, debating it all and going down there, what I'm going to say is this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hear them out briefly. I'm talking like two minutes because, you know, love is, is what we, you know, we lead with love in everything, okay? So the loving thing is, is to lead them. But the, the most loving thing is, to, uh, is for me to go and find people who are really ready for Jesus. So I'm going to say to the gentleman or whoever, I'm going to say, look, excuse me, sir, I do have to go. I don't really have time for, for an argument, uh, a debate. It's not really what I'm looking for. Um, it's not really what we're here for. But uh, could I pray for you? So I would always try and finish it with a prayer because what, they'll go, ah, you're not praying for me or something, you know, and that ruffle the feathers in some way, or they might let you pray. So I would always try to end it by saying, look, uh, you know, I do need to go, but could I pray for you? You see, the Bible says, be wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. We don't have to stand there for 30 minutes while they suck the life out of us with these debates to be loving. That's not loving. That's being a carpet that they're walking over, okay? As my friend says, we're not born yesterday, we're born again. So there's a difference. So you don't have to be a sucker. Uh, you just be, you know, be wise. I'm not standing there with a guy because it's going to stop me. It's going to hamper me from what I'm here to do. Okay. Who else? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So obviously, like you guys, you know, we all, we've all got a level of intelligence. Look up, you can read people's body language too, you know. So one of my guys was training on a Tuesday night in, in Subway and stopped a lady there and went through the, the card with, the, with her. And she had a, her uh, ear, earphones in, her headphones in. So he's like, can I ask you a question? She's like, and then he carries on going through the whole thing and she's got her earphones on. So I'm not really thinking that's, you know, and she, she wasn't interested, but he just because we're kind of like innocent, new to it. So he just carried on. She couldn't even hear what he was saying because she had her earphone listening to music the whole time, you know. So, um, so, you know, you've got to use, read people's body language. Are they engaging? Are they, like, looking at the watch? You know, that kind of thing. They might still stay there, but be like, or whatever. So, you know, and if they're like that, then I would, I would just leave it, yeah. You know, I would let them know Jesus loves them. You know, great way to finish. Hey, look, Jesus loves you so much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head on, but Jesus loves you so much. God bless you. Just, you're going to have to maybe just interject in some moments. And you're just going to have to be, be bold, um, okay? If, if you're feeling that the person is just not interested, then that's okay because... You're wasting their time and your time, yeah? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, I've been having a lot of challenges with this particular area because of the issue of love. Mm. And I think what it is is that I really want my love to be authentic to people and not based on my own love. Yeah. And I'm worried about doing the right thing if I don't have the person I love to love. I hear you. Good question. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, let me give this. This has just led me to a real great point, okay? So 
as because we're so because we're seasoned sowers, yeah, many of us. So what we do is this: for, for many believers, we're trying to play the long game, but we're doing it with an ulterior motive. So what we're trying to do, we we bring people on courses. It takes 12 weeks. We give them food. We buy them books. What we what we do a lot of the time, we try and earn equity enough with a person. Uh, we try and become their friend. Um, so it may be not as immediate as this. Maybe it's a long, uh, the long game, but it's the same principle. We're trying to earn their friendship. We're trying to get on side with them in some way in order to then ans- ask them the question. So it may be we don't view it that way, but that's what we're doing. We're like, okay, you know, let, I just want a bit of friendship evangelism. Let's just become friends with this person for, for six months. Is, it, is that any different? Well, I think it's worse because at least we're showing them what we're here to do. We're not hiding behind anything. There's no ulterior motives. The only agenda is that you're dying without Christ. The only agenda is that if you die, you go to hell. That's my agenda. My agenda is I love you so much that I, I want to speak to you about Jesus. That's my only agenda. Um, so I know it can seem abrupt in the way we're going, but there is no hidden agenda. We don't want nothing from you apart from we, we, if, you're, if you're ready to listen, we'd love to, to share the gospel. Whereas I see so many things going on that are hidden agendas. Like, well, hey, hey, can I just hang out with you or, or can I become, you know, we try and get to be friends with people. And that's just, man, that's an agenda. Uh, would you guys agree that you see that? Have you, are you familiar with that, where people do such things? Uh, friendship evangelism, different things, where we're just trying to get on side. And what we're trying to do is create an atmosphere that's conducive enough for our level of faith in order to share the gospel. I trained a, a pastor in Paris, uh, the, the, this tool. He invited me to, to his church. I trained him up. After one session, he said this, I prefer my way of doing evangelism a lot more than this. I said, okay, no problem. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. What's your way of doing it? He said, well, I go to the park every morning, and for two minutes I talk about the weather. After I've talked about the weather, I say, by the way, I'm actually a pastor. Uh, um, you know, c- could I talk to you about Jesus? I said, I prefer, he says, I prefer that way. I said, of course you do, because you're in control of it. That's why you prefer it, okay? Because what he's doing, he's creating an atmosphere conducive to his level of faith. He's not trusting the gospel and the Holy Spirit right from the off. He's trying to get a warm, fuzzy atmosphere, get on side with the person, build a rapport, and then I'll strike. Like the superhero Clark Kent thing. I'm actually Superman. I'm actually, you know, that kind of thing. So it's like, let's just, let's just let him, let him let's warm them up a little and then do it. But I believe... If you trust the Spirit and put your faith in Him, then you're going to go straight into that situation with nothing but Him. And at least that person knows that where you're coming from is, is, is what you want. There's none of this, hey, yeah, it's a great day. It's a lovely day. Okay, and by the way, you know, for me, that's way more of an agenda. And the guy actually went on to realize that, that actually this bore a lot more fruit than what he was seeing doing that way. And he embraced it. He led many people to the Lord. His daughter led a Muslim to the Lord. She'd never led anyone to the Lord. So as he went on and gave it a chance he saw the, the, the fruit, you know. But, um, so I hear what you're saying. But a lot of the time, we're kind of thinking it carnal mind-wise. And we've just got to trust. Trust the Spirit. As long as you're doing this in love. When I go out there, I'm not looking right. How many people can I get saved? How many numbers on my chart? How many people can I tell I led to the Lord? That's not my agenda at all. Um, my heart in this thing is that without Christ, you're dying. And you're lonely and you're hurting. And he loves you so much that he died on a cross to bring you into a relationship. You know, that's my agenda. That answers your question. Yeah, a couple more. Yeah. Good question. So with, with rejection, as simple as this, that I don't own the apples. They're not my apples. I'm a laborer in the harvest. Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. If they were my apples, I could get offended, but they're not. I'm just a worker. I'm just someone who says, God, I'm going to, I'm going to, work with you. I'm going to do my bit. So that's kind of one of the big reasons. And the other reason um, is that you've got, to, you've got to just, it's kind of practice. So the more you speak to people at the beginning, you can, t- you can take it personal, but it's not you they're rejecting. They're just not ready for Jesus. You know, you're not, you're not just putting yourself out there saying, hey, I want to be your new best friend, or this is what I'm selling, or this is what I'm delivering. All you're doing is presenting Jesus and saying, do you want him? Nowhere in this card do we say, this is who you are, you're a sinner, uh, you pray, uh, but uh, we, we don't do that. We say, here's the options, is this you? That's all we're doing. Say, hey, here, here's what we're putting out there, is that, is that you? And they say, yes, I'm, I'm the sinner, I've got the bag, you see? So there's nowhere along the way we're telling them. So don't get offended, because it's, um, it, but it's going to take practice, and your skin will get a little thicker the more you do it, but you've just got to dig in. Um, let me just share this quickly, and I'm, I'm sorry, I know we're going over a bit, but... 
Is this how listening? This is helpful. Okay, when you when you go onto the streets today, who hasn't done much evangelism, stopping strangers? Who hasn't done a whole lot of it? Okay, so a lot of you guys. Okay, so when you go out, this is how it's going to be. You're encased in a cocoon for some of you guys right now. Now it's called it's like a chrysalis stage. You know when a caterpillar foot morphs into a butterfly and goes through that uh, that process. Yeah, what happens is this: they're encased in a cocoon. They apply pressure and they break out the cocoon. They f- form wings to fly freely as a butterfly through the metamorphosis stage. Now what happens is this: for believers, we are encased in a cocoon. It's a cocoon of fear, trepidation. Society's told us you can't do this. All these things, and as we step out. You're going to, everything inside of your flesh is going to say, this is weird, uncomfortable, don't do it, go back in church and sit there, or whatever it may be, okay? It's going to be, it's going to feel strange. But how you break out your cocoon is this, number two are my top three. Number one, read the card. Number two, you stop as many people as you can. So if you come back here and say, hey, no, I didn't really go very good. How many people did you stop? Uh, Four. I'm like, go back and get a zero on that before we even talk. You need to be stopping, excuse me, and I'm not talking about fruit, I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about what happens to them. All I'm concerned about today is what happens to you, because you've got your whole life to catch apples, but what we're bothered about right now is breaking you out of that cocoon, forming your wings to fly freely as an evangelist butterfly. That's what I'm concerned about, and I promise you this tool will enable you to do it. If you embrace it, and if you step into it, and, and you, excuse me, can I, no, okay. Excuse me, could I ask you? And you go from one to the next to the next. I promise you, if nothing, forget the fruit. Forget what happens to them. But I promise you, you'll come back here and you'll be no longer encased in a cocoon. I've seen it happen with the most timid people, the most shy, nervous people. They've come out, have come back, and they're free. I've seen it with others who have more confidence. They come back the way they left. So it is down to how much you apply that pressure and you'll get some cracks and you'll begin to step out. But you've got to... Apply your B.O. and G.O. You know what I mean? You've got to count that cost, you know? Yeah. Well, we have, we have an app, Jesus at the Door app. We have about 25 languages on it. So sometimes I'll go on the app and I'll ask them to read it themselves. Sometimes. Uh, I've done it also. I've done Google Translate. I was in Arlington, actually, in this area. Come back from a hotel, uh, to stay in my hotel. Guy sat on the, Spanish guy sat there on the stairwell. I went through Jesus at the Door, the whole thing, through Google Translate. The guy got saved and came to church the next day. Incredible. It's amazing. And then a Spanish family embraced him and, and discipled him. So whatever way you've got to do it, be creative. Do you know what I mean? You know, do whatever you've got to do. Google Translate, whatever. You know, whatever you, uh, you know, the app, whatever you want. Yeah. Okay, a couple more, then we better get out there, yeah? Good question. Yeah. Yes. I hear you. Great question. Great question. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is giving you like this is giving you what you need. But I mean, the idea is that you still you, you still be you. So we don't want to turn you into anyone. And what we want, what we're trying to do is set you free. So you're a cocooned caterpillar, and we're trying to break you free to fly as a butterfly. That's our mission. Which means, to, in order to do that, you've got to be you, not Todd White or not this guy or that guy. You know, we want you to be you. This tool will enable you to break out of your cocoon and fly freely as a butterfly and be fruitful. So in order to do that, um, what you've got to do is, I just had a total mind blank. Sorry, what, real quick. So, like, if they, if, if they ask them, are you willing to follow Got it, got it, okay. So, <laughs> sorry. So that point, what you're making is perfect, okay. I've had that happen to me. I was in London, and I shared the gospel with these two guys. I'm like, okay, you f- turn follow. He's like, yeah, but what does that mean? Exact same thing. What does it mean to follow? So the point I'm trying to say is, you, you guys have enough knowledge to be able to answer that question, I'm sure. We've all been around lo- long enough to be able to give an, an, uh, an answer, and it doesn't have to be a big, deep answer. So I just said to the guy, you're leaving, what you're doing is at the, mo- at the minute, you're the shepherd of your life. You go where you want to go, but you're making Jesus the shepherd of your life. So you're literally saying, man, I'm not going I'm, I'm to go the way I want to go anymore. I'm going to let Jesus lead my every step. And what, what shepherds do is they lead the sheep. They protect them. They provide for them. So you're becoming dependent upon your shepherd, not upon yourself anymore. And you're making him number one in your heart. So that's the kind of, I'm, I'm just making it clear. I've got to be honest. I want them I'm edging for them not to accept the name more than for them to accept. That's, that's, that's where I'm going. Just because I'd rather them not do it and then do it later. 
Like I don't want them accepting the Lord right now. Like they could be 90% sure, but if it's 10%, then we'll carry on, I'll meet them, but I'm waiting. Because when it happens, I want it, to be re- I want it to be the right moment. This is really important. So I'm going to edge more on the area of, you know, are you sure this is what you want right now? I'm not trying to like, you know, trick them in some way. Oh, no, no, just pray this and you, you, you'll, you'll get it. It's all good. You know, which some people do, which is crazy, but I've seen it. Okay, so that's really important. We're just trying to explain. And just use your common sense, use your wisdom, whatever you know. And the Lord will compensate for the rest, I promise you. Okay, one more question and we better get to it. Yeah. That's okay, that's okay. Yeah, no, that's okay, it's totally fine, okay. So in terms of giving out church cards, 100%, I do it all the time, especially with someone I led to the Lord, they ain't leaving without a church card, okay. But that's only half of it, that's only 50%. Now, a church card, I can't fight for them tenaciously to make a disciple out of them when the devil's hitting them hard uh, with, with a church card. Uh, and what people do is this, they lead them to the Lord, give them a church card, and then they come to church on Sunday, and they're looking through the door, and then they get disappointed when their new convert doesn't show up. Because from, what day is it? Wednesday. Because from Wednesday to Sunday, that's a long time and a lot, a lot of beating the devil can bring someone. So what I would suggest is this. I'm not leaving without your contact details. No, I don't tell them that, but i am be honest, that's how I feel. Now, 99% of people I've led to the Lord have given me their contact details off the bat just like that. Because it's a kingdom moment, I make it very natural, I don't make it weird. But if you, don't, if you don't want to do that, I would say do it anyway and then pass it on to somebody. Because I'd rather you give the pastor that person's contact details and let him follow them up than nobody follow them up. Because this thing is a fight to the death. I've seen it, man, I'm telling you. I've, I've, been, like, I've been on the front lines for a number of years winning souls and I've seen the devil throw everything he can throw. He gets dirty, and I've seen it. Like, somebody gets saved, they walk away. There's the phone call from, from the, the girl that was never interested in them. Now wants to date, date him. Or the drug dealer, or, or the job offer. I've seen it all. He'll throw, he plays dirty, and he'll do whatever he's got to do. And don't be, don't be naive. This is not against flesh and blood that we fight. It's principalities and powers. And he will resist that person. So giving a church card and saying, see on Sunday, I, I'm just, it's just not going to cut it. So we've got to, even if you can't do it yourself, I understand that. And I'm not asking you as a lady to disciple a man. I wouldn't, I'm not asking that. I'm just saying we have a body of believers. And I'm sure there are plenty of people who would love to disciple anybody. So, so even just get their number and say, I'm going to pass it on to, to my pastor and he'll be in touch. Or something like that, yeah? Is that cool? Okay. So I want you guys to, uh, to step out and we want to have a go at this thing. I realize we've gone a little over, um, but I want us to at least have some time where we do it. Is there anybody who cannot go onto the streets and do this right now? Raise your hand. Anyone who's not able to do it? Okay. So for the rest of our, would you, uh, John, would you like me to, to pair up? Would you like to pair up? Would you like them to pair up themselves? I mean, how, how should we go about this? You, you have, it sounds what you think. I think it says they go about their business. Is that right? Yeah. Hey, wasn't that great? It's challenging, thought-provoking, encouraging, helpful. Thank you, Scott. We're going to be back at 7 o'clock. Um, the way we usually do it is, like, you might have some people you're here with, and you guys are just ready to go out. You guys are dismissed. We're, like I said, we'll be back here at 7. The doors will be open a little, probably around 6.30 or a little before that. Um, so you can get dinner and whatnot. And I just, you know, go to the mall, go to a grocery store. If you don't have people that you're going with or you, or you feel like, you don't have enough experience, you'd like to try it with somebody that's at least tried some forms of evangelism before. Um, can you stand up if you say, I would like somebody to help me out a little bit? Just stand up if you feel like you want someone to, no shame. We've all needed people to help us out. And whether you want to partner with somebody else that <laughs> needs help together, or is there anybody that you guys would look around and say, hey, I'm willing to take one of these guys out that's standing up, that I've had experience. You probably have not had experience with Jesus at the door because most of us is a new tool for. But if you've had experience stepping out in some kinds of evangelism and you're willing to try Jesus at the door with somebody else, just go talk to, to that. Just make sure that you connect to them real quick. All right. You can just 
go uh, touch base. Otherwise, it looks like most of you probably have somebody here that you're willing to try this out with. And hey, we're believing that God's going to do something in this next couple hours, and you're going to come back with a story or two or three or whatever, and uh, get to share. Maybe a few of you get to share tonight and share with one another. Uh, it really helps to come back and debrief or say, hey, I got to this point like three times, and then it fell apart, and maybe ask each other questions. And you grow by doing it. And like Scott said, your gifts grow in the garden of Jesus at the door. They grow in the activity of going. And so you just got to try it out. And it's okay to stumble at something because, like they say, if, you know, if someone's worth saving, that's worth doing badly. What does that mean? If you're going to save them, then save them. It doesn't matter if you do a good job or not, right? It's like, do whatever you need to do to save them. So it's because we love people and we love Jesus. So just go try it out and watch what God's going to do by your step of obedience. Amen? So, um, um, I would say two groups can go to Walmart. But if we get four or five, because it's right across the street, Walmart starts to pick up that there's all these people with cards. And again, it's not a problem. Like if you have to go to the mall or you need, if you need milk, go to Walmart, go to Safeway, get milk. And while you're there, start talking to everybody you see and ask, see if you can ask them a question. Um, but I would, you know, we've got Walmart here, but I'd go to the Everett Mall, Alderwood Mall. I mean, there's, a, I don't know if it's raining right now or not, but there's a lot of people on the street walking around, but the bus stops on the corner. Um, you can go to North Everett if you want to be around a lot more street people around the bus station um, uh, around there or uh, you just go to any grocery store or like shopping center pretty much you'll get a lot of foot traffic so tonight is at 7 tonight at 7 is more training from Jesus at the door there'll be other people coming we'll do worship um, and we'll do some training and maybe we'll have some time for prayer and encouragement and whatnot so yeah, and I'll probably, I'll probably, I mean, I'll kind of interweave that with some, some other stories and, and different things like that, and share some uh, kind of stuff with you guys. I mean, honestly, my biggest thing, what I would say to you, because I can feel some of your feelings right now, mm -hmm. okay, in, in the in the spirit, and we're gonna pray before we go as well. But, yeah. but honestly, guys, I, you know, I promise, if I could be with every single one of you, then that that would make me happy. You know, if I could, if I could split myself in, in fifty, I would do it, because because that's what I love to do. When I take teams out, I spend time with them. Um, I just, if you, if you go through with this, if you trust the Lord and trust his card, and I know it's hard because you're not, you haven't seen it work, but if you can apply enough faith to just stick to it and read it and stop as many people as you can. I mean, you came here, you gave up an afternoon. You don't, don't, go, don't go without kind of doing the best part, you know, which yeah. is to put it into practice. Yeah. Stop as many as you can and just go for it. Dive into it. You know, when I, I remember one quick thing. Okay, I, I went on this, when I first got saved, <laughs> I, know, I talk too much, sorry. I got, first got saved, I really liked this girl. I was a brand new believer. So I go away on this camping trip and they have this huge rock where people jump off this rock like really high up into the water. My friend says in front of this girl, I like, hey, you should do it. And I don't like heights, so I'm like, oh, yeah. Well, no, I'm, I'm good. He's like, and they're all looking at me like as if, you know, I'm scared. I'm like, yeah, I, I can do it, yeah. So I go and I walk and there's a huge line on the rock. Now I knew if I stayed at the back of the line and waited my turn, then I would, I would, uh, I would uh, chicken out. So what did I do? I walked right past everybody and just jumped. <laughs> so for some of you guys, don't stand there with your partner talking about the weather or your favorite football team. You gotta just jump, okay? Once you jump, then you'll find out that you can swim. But I encourage you, you're gonna have to go out there. As soon as you hit those doors, if you see a human being walking past, go. Don't wait for like, you know, the sun to move this way and the, the clouds that way. You know, you go and you dive in and you stop. And as you stop, you'll find it's not as scary as I thought it was. But you need to do it. You've, you've got the BO, but you've got to apply it, okay? It's your, it's your cost. Go for it. Yeah, the third rule is to get their follow-up details. So she covered it for us. Yeah. We actually ran out of our follow-up cards. We can't get you them at a later date. So for now, I would suggest get people's phone numbers uh, uh, or social media. Facebook's a great one uh, because it's, it's still kind of not as personal. But just ask. Just say, hey, you know, I want to help you take your new steps. You know, they've just said they want to turn and change direction. Well, I want to help you do that. I want to invite you along to our church. Just jot down your number, even on a church card, and I'll send you a message and invite you along. Yeah, there's some church cards out there on the Connection Center desk. Be bold with that. Be bold with that. If you make it weird, then it will become weird. Mm -hmm. I promise you.
Don't make it weird. Just say, hey, excuse me, if you j- just jot down your number, I want to invite you along. Don't make it all weird if you want to, but I'll, maybe you don't. And, you know, okay. Yeah. yeah. This, is not, uh, this is not a trap. This is not to give out. This is only for you to read. You will be amazed at how God's prepared people. I was at 112 eating with a man from Alabama who came to tell me what had happened when I was in Alabama. And I'm getting ready to leave, and I can't. There's this tall Japanese man with a woman, I don't know if it's his wife, who I, I can't get my mind off them. So I said, before we leave, could I just go and ask that man? I just feel like I'm supposed to pray for him. So I just walked over, and I said, uh, I've been sitting over there, and I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor down there, and I just felt like I was supposed to pray for you. And that's all I said. He began weeping uncontrollably. He said, I was just here sitting talking to my sister, telling her I need to get right with God, and I need to find a pastor in a church. And I was just there eating breakfast on my day off with somebody, but all I did was say, could I pray for you? I'm telling the story. While I'm telling the story about him, the next Sunday in the service about how God can lead you, he walks through the back door, and I give an altar call, and he gets saved. He works at a place where one of my best friends is one of the, at the golf course. He's the chef down at the golf course, and my best friend is there, and he's been following him up. So, you know, God can even help you get people to follow up people when yeah. he can. Yeah. Yep. Amen. Okay, you ready? He's ahead. Yeah. Let's pray, Let's pray and go. Go for Pray for us. Yeah, come on. Yes, we'll make sure you get it. Holy Spirit, thank you, Lord, that when you were, that when Jesus said that, that I'm going to send you a comforter and he's going to enable us to, to speak boldly. And I thank you that we have that comforter. Thank you the Holy Spirit lives within us. I thank you that every ounce of boldness that we need, we already possess it. We don't need to pray and fast for boldness. We've got it already. And I ask you, Lord, for every individual in this room, I ask you that you would awaken it and that it would uh, come to the surface right now. I pray for that boldness. Thank you that, like we read in, uh, in Proverbs 28, uh, 1, that we are, the righteous are as bold as a lion. And I ask you for, the, for some lions and some lionesses right now to rise. I ask you in Jesus' name, Lord, that for some of these people, that a roar would begin to stir inside of their spirit. And they would know that no more fear, that no more lies are going to hold them back from being fruitful. No more lies are going to stop them from being the disciple maker you called them to be. So every spirit of fear and timidity that would try and rob these people, we bind it right now in Jesus' name. And we'd release kingdom boldness, fire from heaven. Fresh fire from heaven, boldness from the throne of God. This day, I pray, Lord, awaken them to their call, awaken them to their destiny, and we prophesy about all the people that are going to get saved in this next hour or two, and we thank you already in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.